with you this afternoon. So this title of National Education Initiatives, Drivers of Success, has a very deliberate question mark at the end. We want this to be an hour and a half where we can really question and explore the issues around national education initiatives and funding and celebrate the positives, but also perhaps talk about the potential negative effects that this kind of investment, these kinds of programs have. I think ultimately the question is a good question to debate because it really asks how can we improve universities? But from where I'm standing looking at almost 200 people in the room, I'm sure you all have your own ideas. And so as much as our five experts here today will explain a bit about their systems, their perspectives, and the roles and responsibilities they have, we very much want to hear from you as well. And obviously, after the 90 minutes, we have welcome reception this evening for the summit, and I hope that we can continue this conversation, this, this vital debate. So we wanted in this panel to bring together people representing different systems, some from countries where there are huge amounts of public investment going into national excellence systems, and others from countries where there are none. We wanted to bring people together from some highly internationalized systems and other countries which are still emerging on that track. And there is 90 minutes for this session, and it would take me 90 minutes to read out all the achievements and the positions of this distinguished group of experts, so I'm going to very quickly introduce them, and then I will let them speak. So, we have, in order of, of the alphabet, the English alphabet, we have Professor Isaac Fruman, who's the head of the Institute of Education at the Higher School of Economics here in Moscow, or in Moscow, which was founded in 1992, but has already risen within the top 100 of Times Higher Education's young university rankings. We have President Hong Chiang, Chiang, Chiang Hong, I'm, I said that I wouldn't do that, and I've done it. President Chiang Hong of Shantou University, which is a comprehensive university in Guangdong in southeast China, founded in 1981. And in addition to government funding, also receives funding from the Li Ka-shing Foundation. It has more than 10,000 students, and since 2015 is developing a new technical institute in partnership with Technion University in Israel, one of Israel's great research universities. I have Pro Professor Alan Lau, who's the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Performance and Development at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne. He's come all the way from Australia to be here this afternoon. And they have another campus in Malaysia. And Swinburne is also in the top 100 of our young university rankings and has almost 14,000 students with a quarter coming from overseas. Andre Volkov, Professor Andre Volkov is the uh, academic policy advisor at the Moscow School of Management. He's a deputy chairman of Project 5100 Russian Excellence Council. He's an expert in education policy, advisor to the Ministry of Education and Science of the Russian Federation. And he's also a great friend of Times Higher Education, so we're very pleased to see him here this afternoon. And Akiyoshi Yonezawa, who is the director of international at Tohoku University. Anaki is a highly distinguished scholar of higher education. He's head of institutional research at Tohoku, which is the third oldest imperial university in Japan. And it was also third in our Japanese university rankings just last year. So without further ado, I will sit down. And I would like to introduce Andre Volkov to start the discussion, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I'm OK? OK. Thank you, Tim. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I see in the room a lot of people who are actually represent uh, universities from this initiative. So for Russian part of the room, it will be uh, very clear, clear and almost uh, obvious what I'm going to say here. Um, but I would say that uh, Russian Excellence Initiative was started, was initiated in uh, 2012. And uh, the reason was uh, that low level or low uh, rank of Russian university in a global university landscape, which is not everybody was happy in, in the government and the university community about this fact. And uh, it's not just about position in uh, global ranking 
more important was that we still have a brain drain uh, some of the best students uh, and the young researchers of my country uh, select not Russia but other universities around the world. And we are not was happy at that time uh, about this fact. Actually, before 2012, a small group of rectors, I was part of this story as well, initiated the discussion with government and just after two years, the project itself uh, was launched. So the goal was to increase research capacity of Russian university, and we need to take into consideration, especially for international audience, I would say, that uh, like probably in French model, in Russia, uh, research sector, um, most, mostly in um, Russian Academy of Science, was historically separated from universities. So universities mostly were concentrated on education and training. That's why one of the primary goals of the project was to bring it together, to enhance, to increase research capacity of the best Russian universities. Second, definitely to increase international visibility, international position of uh, best Russian school and Russian university. Um, and definitely, last but not least, uh, at the end of the game, it's not just about ranking, not just about pure research, citation and publication. It's about influential, to be impactful for national and regional economy, to be uh, important, a key element for uh, economic and uh, technology development. That was the goal uh, behind the uh, Russian Excellence Initiative. Because the President's decree was about to put to position five, at least five Russian universities above, uh, inside of best 100 schools in the world, that's why informally we call it five 100 project. Not just long name Russian Excellence Initiative about competitiveness, and so on and so far. So we call it 5100 because we the initial idea to, to have at least five inside of 100. And uh, I believe the very important part of the, this initiative is design. Uh, the decision was made uh, to invite all, potentially all universities participate and uh, Roughly in Russia, 800 schools, more than 100 applied, and 21 was selected. Uh, the decision was made, and I believe it was a key decision, to put strategic power, strategic authority, not to the Ministry of Science and Education, but to the International Council. And we invited 12 people, five national and five uh, six national and six from uh, international, um, international community to be part of the panel. The third point, we decided to divide this selected 21 university for three groups. Let's call them A, B, C. And uh, group A from five to seven universities uh, get 70% of the funding which create pressure, tension, and competition inside of this group. The initial money was close to 2 billion US dollars, uh, but in the six years from that period of time, the currency change bring us, uh, I would say now, it's not more than 1 billion US dollars for the whole project. It's, it's not a small money for, uh, for Russian universities, but at the same time, it's just not more than 7 to 10% in, uh, in annual budget of uh, Russian universities. So it's not a critical money. From a reputation point of view, it's a critical money, but for funding, for the whole budget of the university, it's not so crucial. And uh, we developed, I call this in my language, three-dimensional approach. 
when we estimate or evaluate universities by uh, their position in global ranking, institutional and uh, subject ranking. At the same time, we estimate them formally to measure their capacity in publication, citation, in uh, quality of the students, and so on and so far. And again, last but not least, we decided to evaluate their strategy, priority, leadership, team, and the point like this, which is very difficult to measure. That's why we invite experts and panel, and they're making their judgment about their, this type of capacity of university. That's why we have such a three-dimensional vision and three-dimensional evaluation of the university inside of the program. And uh, trying to be short in this story, it's a lot of discussion about money, a lot of discussion about the ranking, but I would say that the whole project is not just about money, uh, because as I already mentioned, it's not more than 10% for the best school in their budget. Uh, and it's not just about ranking position. It's about ability to change, to rethink, reorganize, redesign their vision, their curriculum, their research policy, and to be, at the end of the game, in a different rank, in a different position in the global landscape. So, to have much bigger impact for economic development, to be able to attract best people inside of the country and outside of the country. It's the only reason to call them competitive, best in competition, Russian university. So the whole project, and I would say it in, in, in my last point, just in five years, Russian school demonstrate, uh, from my perspective, very remarkable speed of change, and uh, if we take a ranking, institutional and uh, subject ranking, we can see almost 50% growth for every school in a different, in a different, in a different position and different ranking. Probably uh, some of them enhance or increase their position as minimum two times, uh, double, double their position in a global ranking. That's why, from my perspective, that's why I believe that it's a very successful initiative. And uh, last but not least, once again, it's create a benchmark for not just for these kind of 21 selected best schools, but for whole Russian university system. That's, that's my point. Thank you, Tim. Can you see? Yeah. Can you listen to me? Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Jiang Hong, president of Shantou University. I am honored to have been invited to attend the panel discussion. Shantou University is a comprehensive public university located in Guangdong Province, People's Republic of China. It was established in 1981 with a generously funding from Mr. Li Ka Cheng a famous anti-pressure. By far, the Li Ka Cheng Foundation has in market a grant of over 10 billion Hong Kong dollars to support the university's development. We have 10 colleges and schools, nine residential colleges and five affiliated hospitals. Credent, they are around over 10,000 300 full-time students and 1,060, 630 full-time faculty members. Among our faculty members, over 60% are with doctor degree and 15% are foreign faculty members. Our university is ranking with the number 601 to the 800 in the THE. Uh, ranking. 
and uh, November 151 to 200 in the, the Young Universities ranking. Now I would like to briefly introduce some of the major of excellent initiatives in China during the past uh, decades. In 1995, China carried out the first national excellence initiative, the 211 project, focused on the construction of around 100 higher education institutions and a number of key disciplines, addressing the strategy needs to the 21 center. This was fo followed by the 985 project, which was intentioned in 1999. Government funding are given to develop 39 design university into first class university in the world in the, 19, in the 2019. A new intensive called the double first class uh, initiative was introduced in China. This most update national excellence initiative aims to a limited built a number of world-class university and display by the end of 2015 in an effort to make our country an international higher education power. In September 2017, 137 university and 465 display was announced to the first batch of designed university and display of this initiative. Uh, these universities and display were mainly invited in six iPads, students' cultivation, scientists', scientific research, community service, culture inheritance and uh, innovation, faculty team construction and international exchange and cooperation. In Guangdong province, where our university is located, a 211 project and a double top tier initiative uh, province level were also carried out in accordance with the national excellent initiatives. Here, double top tier standard for top tier university and the top tier university of science and engineering. Shantou University is one of the universities which benefit from China education strategy and its excellent initiative. We are established the STU CDIO engineering education model to support national excellent talent training program. This is an internationally recognized engineer education model. We took the leader in CDIO engineering education reform in China and built an education model called OBE CDO. The focus on the outcome based education model as well as learning from the essence of CDIO model. This achievement has provided some positive impact on the country's launch of national excellent engineer education scheme. It also provides refer reference for the top, tier, top level design and uh, specific implementation of this, uh, of this scheme. And uh, our university has become one of the four lending institutions in the country for the new engineer discipline construction scheme recently carried out in China. Top tier international cooperation is important in our pursuit of excellence. In December 2016, the Minister of Education approved the from established of Guangdong Technio Isro Institute of Technio, Technio Isro Institute of Technology, an uh, institute of high learning joined launch by our university and the Technio Isro Institute of Technology. The cooperation between our two institution is developing repeatedly. Another example of our achievement in international cooperation is a re research team on very in fitness disease chaired by one of our faculty members who win the grand prize of the 2017 National Award for Science and Technologies Progress. 
There are all a publishment with the help of extensive and in deep international cooperation network. Uh, most recently, national contest in China is what we call the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Great Bay area. Our university is working on incorporating this national strategy into our mission to save this society, especially to support the construction of castle economic region. We are working with regional and local government to join build a number of research institutions with dissentive characters, and we are also cooperating with industry in the research and the development of core technologies. We hope to better see our local community and to continuously promote the transformation of the science and technology achievements. We believe that in return, all of the efforts will foster our own development within the university. And I, again, I'm very pleased to be given this opportunity to share with you with the excellent international team in China and our attempts and the practice in making Shantou University and excellent high education provide in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jian Hong. And Aki, would you like to um, explain a bit more about the work that Tohoku? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, does it work? Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Aki Yoshonezawa, and uh, I have to inform that uh, my uh, title is a bit changing because uh, from uh, last month, I moved to the International Strategy Office uh, from the uh, last uh, work at the Institutional Research Office. So the, uh, the di I'm now vice director, and the director is a vice president, but uh, basically that we are, uh, try have a responsibility to make a strategy especially uh, to connect our university to the international affairs. And it's really an honor for me to be in Kazan because almost every Japanese citizen knows Kazan as a name uh, because of the, uh, the very, very uh, famous, uh, our uh, Japanese football player uh, stayed here in Kazan uh, in the World Cup time. So the, it's a really, really honor as a representative of Japanese citizen to be here. Okay, so the, our, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the Japanese way of the world-class university policy. And uh, this is a bit uh, different with the, uh, what's going on in China. And uh, at the same time, we are highly influenced by what's going on in other countries, especially uh, uh, United Kingdom, uh, Russia also, and also China. I hope it works. It works, no. You press the, if you... No, <laughs> so, let me go directly. Okay, okay, it works, oh sorry. Okay, so the, this is our campus. So the uh, Tohoku University is a little bit younger than uh, Kazan Federal University. We are uh, uh, established 111 years ago. And, uh, as a third imperial uh, university. So the, after that, we have several so-called world-class university or the uh, policy to uh, distinguish, give the distinguished status to the uh, national university. And uh, uh, the recent one is called a designated national university. So we have 800 university, and within that, 86 uh, national university, and we are uh, within five, top five universities. And this is a new uh, scheme. And why uh, we can do it is that uh, there is a kind of very big pressure for the uh, national government uh, to utilize the, uh, our resources of, I mean, the higher education for the national development. But uh, our situation is completely different with, the, for example, Russia or the China because uh, we are already very mature society and we cannot uh, expect the further development based on uh, the public, increase of the public investment because we are already facing with the very serious problem of the aging, it means that the old people are increasing and the younger generation is, uh, with the population decreasing. So what we have to do is 
I hope it works. Uh, this way. So the basically, uh, what we try to do is to utilize research university as a sector for uh, encouraging the innovation of the society. So the, maybe you are familiar with the term called Industry 4.0, and we also have uh, the, some Japanese version of the, such a term called Society 5.0. And what we're trying to do is basically uh, to uh, utilize the human resource development and the uh, acquirement and the, uh, develop the research capacity, and also the, we are trying to reform the uh, university governance, and also uh, we are trying to make a linkage with the society. By doing so, we want to uh, uh, improve the, our the visibility in the uh, university, including the ranking, and also the, uh, we, want, we want to have some kind of a, the uh, leading uh, position in a, a national innovation. So that is the things uh, that our government is required to do that, and uh, uh, we are trying to respond to that. Uh, uh, and uh, because of that, we got a, a distinguished position. And how to do that? Uh, the the double, double class, uh, double world class university policy in China is quite quite interesting and maybe very straightforward. So the first, you need to have top university. This is very good. And the secondary. The Chinese one is quite wide because uh, if you improve the, each discipline, uh, this will uh, directly enhance the, your position in a, a subject-based ranking. So this is the most direct way. But we are trying to do in a different manner. Uh, actually, we are much more focusing on a multidisciplinary or the interdisciplinary approach. So that's quite, quite interesting and maybe very straightforward. So the, First, you need to have top university. This is very good. And the secondary, the Chinese one is quite wide because uh, if you improve the, each discipline, uh, this will uh, directly enhance the, your position in a, a subject-based ranking. So this is the most direct way. But we are trying to do in a different manner. Uh, actually, we are much more focusing on a multidisciplinary or the interdisciplinary approach. So the, we stick to have some education based on a, a, the traditional subject, but uh, as the research, we are much more focusing on a, a interdisciplinary area, and uh, we are making the, uh, several uh, key priority areas, such as the material sciences, or the uh, spintronics, or the uh, disaster sciences, by doing so, we try to uh, ac uh, assemble the, the kind of all stars of the to uh, Tohoku University and uh, with an uh, international partner and uh, make a kind of visible and a new creation. That is uh, what we are trying to do. So this is a kind of beautiful story of the, our plan. But uh, at the same time, we also have a negative or the, some concern as a national development. Uh, many of you may know that uh, uh, there are three key stakeholders in the university. One is that academics or university, or the uh, states, or the government, or the market. But uh, maybe you are familiar with that uh, at least the university sector, we have a highly, highly diversification in these days. Means that uh, some are quite research university and some are not really the much more focusing on education. The same thing is now happening in the government and the market. Now, what is going on in the government is that, uh, of course, the, the universities are under the supervision of the Ministry of Education and the Research Science. However, adding to that, the Ministry of Finance is also highly paying attention to the university because uh, it is becoming a very big industry. And uh, secondly, uh, the Ministry of Education, Economics and uh, Trade and Industries are also paying attention to this uh, because this is a key fact, a sector for the uh, national innovation through the economic development. So because of that, now uh, the research university issue is no longer the ministry level policy, but the cabinet level policy. So the prime minister uh, directly uh, make a kind of intervention to the what kind of university should be and how universities should be uh, managed, and what kind of people should uh, give the, uh, the kind of the funding for that. 
And then、uh, the market is also changing, not only for the student, the, now the representative of the industry and also the government are trying to give,、uh, raise the voice. Means that、uh, the government is now requiring that universities should hire the senior management officials and the university board members from outside of the academics. So sometimes it is、uh, considered a very good linkage for the business society, but at the same time it is.、Uh, Traditional、uh, point of view,、uh, academic point of view, it is a kind of very big intervention to the university autonomy. Okay, the, finally, the point is that uh, uh, again, very different with the other c o u n t r y Unfortunately, our Ministry of Finance or the,、uh, the Cabinet Office are not so eager to increase the public investment to the research university, unfortunately. So, what they are trying to ask us to do is that the, to in, make an income generation、uh, from the industry, not only from Japan, but from all over the world. So, that any kind of investment from the Russia or the Kazakh,、uh, the, 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 the Italian state to Japan is really, really welcome. But at the same time, it is a really, really tough challenge for us. So, the, let me conclude my presentation as a the very uh, famous uh, remark by the,、uh, Professor John F. Kennedy. Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jackie. <laughs> That was fascinating. So,、uh, Isaac, from your institution in, in Moscow, what's, what's your perspective of, of the National Education Initiative? Is it, is it improving your institution in particular? Uh, Tim, uh, let me. Try to speak not on、uh, behalf of my institution, High School of Economics.、Uh, I can give a very short answer to your question. Yes, it's, it helps, it's improving. But、uh, I would like to say a few words as a researcher in the field of higher education. And、um, our Institute of Education was very privileged to work. Since 2009, with Jamil Salmi on the issue of、uh, world class universities and excellence initiatives. And we published a number of papers comparing excellence initiatives around the globe and trying to understand、uh, the impact. In fact, we are currently、uh, in the middle of Big research project together with the World Bank,、uh, which will try to assess the impact. But、uh, first, I would like to, to, to say that if something happens around the world, it happens for a reason. And we see the excellence initiatives in more than 30 countries. And the total funding of the excellence initiative during the last 15, 20 years uh, uh, is more than $50 billion in total. So, on the one hand, it's kind of in contrary to what Akiyoshi said, the governments put money into the system, but in full agreement with Akiyoshi, they want. The system then to generate big impact for the society and for the country. And that's a big challenge. And we see that,、uh, again, we don't have clear evidence yet about social and economic impact of the excellence initiatives per se, to be clear. But we do see the impact of these initiatives to the competitive positioning of higher education institutions. And China is a great example. We, one cannot、um, uh, reject the statement that、uh, Chinese universities made remarkable progress in. Uh, in the context of a number of excellence initiatives in the country, starting from Project 985. We also see、uh, what, what is common for these initiatives. 
uh, they increase competitiveness. No, no. They increase competition among the universities. And I suspect, and our preliminary hypothesis is that the excellence initiatives are not just a government instrument to push particular universities to the top of international ranking, but to increase competition within the system. Uh, and by the way, we all see that there is no excellence initiative in the United States. But United States already have very strong competitive environment uh, among universities. And for the countries with relatively stable higher education systems with big public funding, the lack of competition between universities becoming an issue. Again, I, uh, I don't want to make a normative statement uh, to say is it good or bad. Uh, we just try to understand what's going on. And we do think that we observe greater and greater competition within the higher education system. Some countries, by the way, uh, do it differently. Um, I see here my friends from Nazarbayev University, which is a great university, established as the university in the country. So there was no particular competition, uh, but Kazakhstan has other uh, policy instruments to increase the competition within the rest of the system. So different countries have different approaches, but again, I see, and it, not, not just me, but uh, we, uh, we think that we observe, in general, greater competition. Where it leads the higher education? Uh, here we have some interesting observations. In fact, a couple of years ago, I attended another THE meeting, and I had a slide um, uh, with some projections on the future of the institutional landscape of higher education system. And I said, it was again five years ago, that we move into the system with a small group of highly selective small research universities, like Princeton, or in, in Russia, Moscow, University of Physics and Technology. And the rest will be big teaching universities, etc., etc. I was wrong. We see now that vertical differentiation is growing because of the competition. But on the top of the system, we see not classical small research universities. We see more and more multi-profile multi-mission institutions with a huge undergraduate uh, students population, with uh, big extended programs for continuing education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, I, I think that the major impact of, of the, and that's my last point, of this national excellence initiatives is the growing differentiation in the system, and we'll observe uh, as a kind of top of the system, there uh, more and more what uh, Barton Clark called multiversities, but in f he was genius because there was no many multiversities at his time, but now we see that maybe the future of education system is growth of this leading group. Um, and maybe in 10 or 20 years, the institutional landscape of higher education systems, especially in big countries, will be very different from what we observe now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isaac. And so last, but my name is least, Alan. It's Australia is a very big country without yes. a national education. It, what, what's the, the view there? What's your perspective from Swinburne? Yes, well, uh, my name is Alan. Uh, I'm working in Swinburne as a provider chancellor, and my role is to look after research strategies and performance and ranking strategy as well. 
And I was working in Hong Kong for almost 20 years, and I have witnessed a lot of changes about just like what Tim mentioned about us, about the research changing, uh, the environment changing. And Australia, unlike the China and Korea, in China, we, they got the 21195X and recently got double world class university, double first class university. In Korea, they got a, they got a world class university programs. So all this money basically go to inject into the new area of research and to support uh, institution to do a good research for the country. But in Australia, because uh, like the, the other country, it's a big, big country, it's actually very structured. They don't have this kind of uh, what they call the uh, initiative, but they already well established their own funding system. They can, assault, they can uh, recruit uh, uh, talents by using the Australian uh, Laurean Fellowship, uh, Future Fellowships, all these kind of things that already be there for almost 10 to 20 years. But in terms of initiative, actually, um, Australia does not have anything just like we try to use the funding to create something new. But mostly a lot of universities, they have their own internal system, try to push the new research directions. Uh, if you ask me about the, um, how the university grows, I can tell you about my university, it's not a big university, it's a middle size. And in terms of capital, space and resources, we cannot compare with the big university because funding model is totally different. And a lot of universities now struggling is a, no matter what you do, you cannot compete with the big university because the funding from the government already there is very big pool of money. But for the medium size, if you want to recruit a better talent, sometimes it's very difficult. I'm sure a lot of universities in the world now try to grab the talents in digitalization, in AI, in robotics. But it's very difficult because your back the package your university pay to the new talents may not be sufficient. Because big university, the package is very attractive. I just got one of the news yesterday, uh, two days ago from China. They want to recruit our talents working in the industry 4.0 in this big area. And only for the relocation cost is about few millions. It's not talking about salaries. So how the medium-sized university can compete is no way. But in that sense, it doesn't mean there's more and medium-sized University have no room to grow. We have to set the right strategies. These strategies is have the university firstly do a good research. Secondly, build up the teaching culture. Thirdly, we have to enhance our reputation. That's a very important. A lot of our university, because based on this new, in, uh, what they call the national research initiative, I use the research terms. Ultimately, ultimately the problem is that almost all universities go to doing research. But how about the teaching quality? That is another big issue. We are doing well, we are educators. We are doing good research, it's our role. But at the same time, teaching is also very important because those graduate later on, they will working for the industry, working in the community. And then in turn, they will do the survey for your ranking and your ranking go up. So this kind of thing is a long-term goal. But my personal feeling is that now the new management system is quite short-term, already talking about three to five years. So, if you are talking doing good teaching from now on, and then your student graduates four years later, and then you want to see the outcome from your student another 10 years, that's too long. And then it's make the whole education system destroyed. So my feeling is a national education initiative is important, but not just tend to one direction. We have to go to more, more uh, uh, comprehensive uh, spectrum. Teaching, research, and also how to support the university, engage with the industry. So what we try to do is that in our university, basically, uh, because uh, I just mentioned to you already, we, have, we are not big university, we don't have big money to recruit a big team of uh, talents from other universities or other countries come to work in Australia. And of course, if you talk about salary, Australian salary is not that competitive compared with some other country as well. So what we try to do is say in the, in, uh, in, Actually, right, quite similar to what I'm presenting in the in the in the periods uh, in the two, uh, in the time summit last year, is we have to do some strategy is to build up your university, make it better, make it more famous. Is firstly what we try to do is say uh, we have to encourage our college doing research with impact. We are not in the past. Well, I still remember when I did my PhD, almost all supervisor told me about you have to do something good based on your publication numbers. If you have more publication, you'll be a good professor. But in reality, at this stage, it's not, it's not right. 
Because a lot of industry, a lot of politicians look at the university as what kind of things you can contribute to the community. So that is the reason why I put in here is a research with impact is a very important. What's the main impact? Citation is one part, okay? The other part is uh, how to translate your research outcome to the industry. How many industrial people want to use your outcomes? How many staff company you will have from your research? So this is a, we are, in our university, we have a big mechanism to support this. If you have a good research outcome, we have a team of people helping you to link up with the industry. And even we have a system to help you to start to, to make your startup company to support your research. And then we have to increase the research student number. I'm sure that a lot of, a lot of uh, medium-sized universities also face with the problem, particularly in some countries, you've got a restriction how many number of PhD students you can have. But from us, we actually, how we increase the PhD, uh, the PhD student number, we establish a lot of joint research center in different countries. We have an assistant, we have a four research center, one in Hong Kong, one in China, one in Korea, and one in India. So this research center, we are focused in different research directions. And this research center can recruit research students and to join our partner or offshore PhD programs. In this way, we can best use our resources to grow PhD students. And remember, if you want to do a good research, the most important is not only talking about how much money you have, it's how many students you have, a good student. So this is the way what we try to do is that we actually have a uh, this kind of job research center in different uh, area in different country. And then engagement with the alumni and employer. This part is a long-term goal. You are a, a lot of, a lot of university, they try to do a lot of uh, exit survey from your graduate because for the auditing, because the government want you to do. But in our university, we, are, we have a deep in engagement with our employer and alumni because those of the students, those, are, those graduates basically they will work in the industry. And then we really want to know about the true feedback to what actually we have in our, in our teaching, what the problem in our university, what's the problem in our, the whole university structure. Based on all this kind of feedback, we can improve our teaching quality. And then in terms of the employer, remember, once you get them in, involved into your system, then they, will, they, they are more willing to support the university, provide more student paymentship provide more funding to support your research projects. And this is a very successful. Later on, you will see another slide to show about the results. And surveys, just to mention to you, this is a true survey. It's not surveys just for the auditing. It's a survey we really want, we really want the negative feedback from our graduates, not the positive. Positive is easy. Okay, you can tailor your questions, but we really want the negative one. And then we know about how to improve our quality of teaching or research or internal uh, structures. And incentive system, that is the most important in, within the university. A lot of universities, they always mention about teaching, research, and the industrial engagement are important. But once you go to the promotion exercise, almost 80% is look at your research profile. So what we try to change is uh, in our university, your income from the government is equivalent to your income from the industry. If you, have IP, if, you have, if you have IP, you have a staff, we also can't have your promotion exercise. Your teaching quality is also be counted. So we have to implement this policy strictly. It's not only on paper. Because of my personal experience for more than 20, 25 to 30 years, and I have witnessed a lot of universities on the paper, but in reality, during the implementation, it's different. And what happened is a, you can do a lot of good research, but eventually industry give the comment about your university is bad, then it will very, very substantially affect your ranking. The reason is that they are the one who do the survey for your universities. So what we try to do, we keep a good relation with the industry. Firstly, for the ranking. Secondly, get them involved in our structures. Thirdly, they, once they get involved into our structure, they, will, they are willing to put the money or put the funding to support our research, teaching, or other activities. So this is uh, the, 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 I just try to make it very simple, okay? For coffee, in, in each of these uh, 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 items, we have a lot of sub-items there. But just share with you about what are my university doing. And I can tell you about in the last, see this, uh, all this uh, strategy. 
uh, start three years ago, and our ranking is growing a lot. So, uh, basically, I can show you is in some of the ranking. We start from three years ago with outside six hundred, and then the other, and then two years ago we come come up to four hundred fifty, and then four hundred, and now three hundred fifty. So, because our uh, this is a uh, this is quite helpful, because we get a lot of uh, people help uh, do a lot of survey for us. So, in terms of our our, 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 our engagement with different institutions in, around the world. So I'll show it to you about in the Asian Pacific region. What we have is that we have a lot of different projects. It doesn't work? Okay. Okay. We have a lot of joint programs with different universities in China, in Thailand, India, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Korea. But our strategy is a in one country, what we try to find our target, it would be a different fields. We don't want to have the same field for more than one university in that particular country because we don't want to induce in, uh, conflicts. So when you look at all this, we are separate in all these different areas. We have a university in, in China working with us in advanced manufacturing, design, civil engineering, high-speed rail, industry 4.0 cyber security, robotics, and auto, automotive engineering. And in this one, next uh, two weeks later, I will go to China to meet one of the company. They donate 10 scholarships for their employee to do the PhD program with us. So this is a way we have to be proactively to go going outside to talk to the company, tell them about the benefits, how we supervise their, 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 student, uh, their employee to bring them to go to a higher level, and how their PhD can contribute to the company business. To do it with the companies, basically is a we are not telling them what we have. The most important, we are telling them how we can improve their business strategy, get their business go to another level. So this is a way I have been doing for almost 20 years and get a lot of funding from the industry. But if you look at the other slide, okay, just go to the more, more new direction, new area. Is, this is a very hot area. Industry 4.0, cybersecurity, bot training, and robotics. And just now, the, uh, our, our colleagues just mentioned about in Japan, and uh, it's called about 5.0 in China, 225. So what we try to do, we have a lot of different parties work together. Collaboration is very important. And then to support our, this area. And basically, based on this strategy, we actually, in the past 12 months, we got about 150 million donation and funding from the industry to support different areas of our research. And of course, some of this money we will also use to support PhD students. And this is a way, this is a strategy we have in our university because in Australia, we don't have this national research initiative. So that's the reason why we have to introduce the, uh, the, the, some initiative within our university to support our, our uh, education systems. That's what I would like to share. Thank you very much, Alan. So I, I think... One of my conclusions from listening to all five of you would be there that, that timing is actually one of the most important, the time frame you set for these initiatives for your strategies. And in your case of working very much to an industry timetable yep. rather than government. So before we go to the floor, maybe I, if I can ask one question, starting with, uh, with President Chan Hong um, and then moving to the rest of you. Would you say that, that national and excellence initiatives in China are, are too focused on, on a relatively short-term improvement in immediate, quick impact at the risk of allowing universities to develop and, and create a longer-term mission. Can we... Is your microphone working? Can we... Yes. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I will take the double first class initiative, for example. We have reviewed the double, double first class construction plan of 13 provinces and the city. And the 69 of these provinces and the city have put forward a detailed plan, which generally include faculty team building and the development, students, Cultivation, scientists' research transformation of uh, scientific and technologies achievement, and the cultural inheritance. Take a lot of the discipline with this province and the city, 
plan to build into world-class, top-tier disciplines, you will find that at least 50 first-level disciplines are on the list, which accounts for 45% of the 110 disciplines list in the China catalog of disciplines for PhD and master degree students' cultivation. Among the design disciplines, 14 display on philosophy and social science and uh, put forward to be built into the first class level in the world. And 17 are to be constructed into national first class level. In terms of science discipline, 36 are to be built into world class level and 33 are to reach national first class level. That means by 2020, nearly half of the disciplines in China will enter the first class level in the world. <coughs> Include not only science disciplines such as mathematics, chemistry, biomedical engineer, and uh, agriculture engineer, but also humanity and social science disciplines such as law, uh, policy, uh, pedagogy. Chinese language and culture, foreign language and culture, and ethnology. Can this goal be achieved? Can this discipline really become first class discipline in the world? The answer remains unknown to us yet. We can only wait and see. Although the double first class initiative is a long term plan, so the period Evaluation is also needed. Credently, and the top of ESI list has become a pursuit of the first class discipline. And uh, recreating talents with title and honor becomes a command practice in building a first class faculty member, faculty team. To build a high caliber faculty team is one of the most important tests in the double first class initiative. Recreating talents would be very necessary to achieve this goal. However, how to define talent? From the construction plan, we found that academics or these who had won the title of the distinguished young scholar or Changjiang scholar, or those who meet the standard set in the China recruitment program of global expectors are extremely popular and uh, there has been false competition among university and rich institute in recruiting this talent. We all know that the first class scientific research is not identical to first class discipline. But some of the uh, problems city and university emphasis a little bit too much on entering the top of the ESI list and set it as important goal in the double first class construction plan. Which means that there is still a big difference in the understanding of first class. It is possible that using academic indicators such as ESI as a key indicator in invalidated the first class discipline or first class university could be misleading in the development of university and the discipline. ESI, I think the ESI indicator is a diminution of paper publishing, but it do, doesn't reflect all uh, diminutions. I'm not saying that this excellent initiative only focuses on the relative short time short-term improvement, but sometimes it's the implementation stage of such an initiative, even for initiatives who forced on the long-term growth. Uh, the actual extols of the, this plan may focus a little bit too much on relative short-term improvement, and the period evolution and adjustment are very necessary to ensure the university develop and evolve and a pretty long-term mission. Thank you. Thank you. And so, in terms of the 
the increase of competition, as you described, Isaac, within that, that top tier of the universities that benefit. Obviously, competition creates winners that we identify, but by nature, there must be, there must be losers as well. I mean, what are the, the negative effects, perhaps, in a, in a Russian context, Andre, as well? Is, it, is there a negative effect? Um, definitely, there are some uh, effects which I would say dark side of the uh, of the initiative, but it's not because it's a nature of uh, excellence initiative, not because the DNA of this initiative. It's because design, everything dependable on how you design this program and how you implement this program. For example, I believe in Russia, based on our experience, uh, negative effect number one is because it's a public money and we need to report for the public money, it increases bureaucracy in every institution. And not everybody happy about this. And uh, we already have a tons of paper we need to report to the Minister of Education, and now it's a double tons of paper. Uh, and everybody is angry about this. Uh, it's, it's a negative uh, point. Uh, second, which is not so clear from the very beginning, I would say is the biggest risk in this kind of initiative to create, uh, Isaac a little bit mentioned about this, to create a special elite club of the best university. Fat cats, uh, sorry to say. Uh, uh, so for example, we selected only 21 universities, it's um, less than 5% of the whole system. And everybody would like to, be, to, to get a st special status, a special money forever. Uh, that's why it's very important to create non-stop competition for all kind of position. Uh, and Isaac mentioned this uh, previously. Uh, and the last uh, point I would like to mention, like a negative effect, it's somehow like a uh, psychological or cultural effect inside of institution. We understand that universities is not quick changes organization. And to put extra pressure for, to compete in for the best position, to compete in for the ranking position, is great for faculty, head of the department, administration, rector's team, extra pressure. It's not a great positive effect sometimes inside of the institution. And we need to take into consideration such a uh, psychology or cultural effect of the, of, the, of the program. But again, at the end of the day, forcing to change and creating the benchmark in international landscape, it gives me more positive uh, votes for the program than in spite of the, all the kind of negative features I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any comments on this side before I invite some questions? Adam? Yes, I'm up. Excuse me? Yeah. Yep. Yep. No, my, my personal feeling is I have witnessed about these kind of competitions. Is normally, you just mentioned about top 5%, but the problem is that if one of the country or one of the small city, they may identify some universities which just intensive. The other one should be teaching, more dom dominated uh, university. But because of these kind of competitions, all these kind of uh, teaching related or teaching dominated university have been criticized as a second tier university. So they try to upgrade itself. So they always have an internal competition, try to convert it, their, their status from teaching and go to research. And eventually they are no longer bear their, their, their primary role to teach well to students. And everybody, almost all professors, just focus on doing research. And then eventually everybody wants to become a tier one. And, and that is a big problem about the country. Because uh, in the country system, we have the top tier, second tier, third tier to do different role of their education, in the education system. But if this competition happened, that may not be healthy. And eventually, it will, will make the whole system quite messy. Thank you. Do you have a, yeah, a comment? Very briefly. Um, you know, um, again, um, I mentioned this competition. And I'm personally not a fan of competition. And my ideal of university is Cambridge. I see here Professor Susan Robertson. And I had a pleasure to walk in the uh, colleges of Cambridge 
And I don't think that Charles Darwin was involved in a uh, ranking game. But, uh, but that's a reality, uh, again. And the governments and the society uh, have to push somehow the universities to change, to reflect the needs of the society. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, there will be losers, and that's a new challenge for public policy. But, uh, and we don't know what to do with them. But let's think about the customers, about the students, employers. Uh, if they are winners, then why should we care about losers' universities? Does anybody have a, a response to that? Why should we care about losing universities? If you uh, would like to also please say your name and institution. Okay. Moscow uh, Gnesian School of Music. I just want to say that sometimes regionally weak universities are centers of culture and education. They can be weak globally. But locally, they are so very important that it's not possible to let them die. I'd applaud that point myself. Does anybody else have any, any particular question for the floor? For our panel, rather. We go to the here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Loretta O'Donnell from Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. I have a question for Isaac. You talk a lot about competition, but at one very profound level, I think all universities in this room are also collaborators because we collaborate in the journey towards wisdom. So I wonder how you work with that great contradiction that one day our next door neighbour is our competitor, the next day our next door neighbour is our research collaborator, our teaching collaborator. How do we move across that continuum? Competition and collaboration. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, uh, for, for me, uh, with my experience in Soviet and Russian system, that question is very difficult. I would, I would ask, in fact, uh, maybe my colleagues to, 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 to say how they uh, do with that. Because in, in, the so, in the socialist and Soviet planning system, the competition, uh, the, there was no competition, uh, and, uh, but there was no uh, volunteer uh, collaboration as well. So everything was planned. Uh, so I, I just, uh, that, that's a good question. And ag again, I do think that the competition harms traditional academic culture. Yeah, uh, but again, we, uh, does it mean that we should stop excellence initiatives? And like my German colleagues complained uh, when Alexander Humboldt University in Berlin was not part of the first round of German excellence initiatives, and they considered it as a great injustice. But in the end, they were forced to, to increase their research productivity. So, uh, again, uh, Loretta, uh, maybe uh, Akahisha, you can say about c collaboration. I, uh, that's a good question. Oh, Alan? Akiyoshi, yeah. Question about collaboration. About competition versus Hello. collaboration. My name is Kadisha Dayerov and I am from Nazarbayev University as well. And thank you very much, Isaac, about your kind words about Nazarbayev University. We are doing our best. Actually, it's not, it's a model and actually it's a tool to reform the whole system of education together with Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools. So we are talking about excellence programs in every country is really saying that every country has its own educational excellence program, national program. Does it mean that all universities, on the one hand, meeting the needs of uh, countries, on the other hand, is concentrate, the, concentrating just 
collecting talents and the gap between talents and those who are left behind is growing. Will it, does it mean that in the future it could lead to some kind of social clash? That's a very big question. Who, would you like to respond? Yeah. To, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so that maybe uh, let me uh, respond from the Japanese case. Uh, the two questions, the competition and collaboration, and also how to meet the uh, kind of global uh, the challenge and also the national needs. And uh, what we are experiencing in Japan is that uh, in our case, we are from the beginning quite hierarchical. So that everybody knows that Tokyo University is number one, Kyoto University number two, Tohoku, Osaka number three, such as kind of thing. And uh, so the, the competition itself is not that new for me, uh, for us at all, uh, for 100 years. However, uh, the, the maybe <coughs> the positive impact of the ranking is that we are now uh, compared with other countries. This really did change a lot. And by doing so, uh, the now we have a much more uh, strong initiative among the different stakeholders that uh, at least in, inside Japan we should collaborate each other. So the, the industry is seriously thinking about how to make use of uh, Japanese university for human resource development and also the, uh, how to uh, develop the, the, our in creativity or the innovation by collaborating among the Japanese uh, counter uh, Japanese stakeholders. And also uh, because we are, we know that the, the, for example, Chinese colleagues or the Russian colleagues and the Korean colleagues are really, really doing a good job. And uh, this is a very big incentive for us to make a kind of a new partnership with them. So the, from that point of view, uh, uh, at least that the, uh, the, the international ranking opened our mind uh, much more wider. But uh, of course, uh, we are suffering a lot, but uh, uh, this is a kind of a controversy we are facing. Thank you. Uh, Andre, yeah. Tim, let me, let me come in back a little bit to uh, to question about collaboration. Uh, I believe it's, uh, it's a little bit artificial question. Why I'm saying like this? Uh, Isaac is right. Uh, and in, 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 in Soviet Union, it was, was close to zero collaboration because everything was centralized. Uh, and still centralized system we have up to now. And the uh, uh, Russian government, for example, uh, stimulates some big grants. And to be applicable for this grant, you need to collaborate. You need to have a bunch of institutions to be uh, applicable for some grant. And it was, it was, from my perspective, and we fail. We fail in this approach. At the same time, if some institution trying to play global games, let's say mega science approach, in this case, collaboration is natural because no one institution, even the best institution in the country, have, uh, has not full set of competence and capacity to play a big <coughs> game, for example, CERN project and so on and so forth. That's why uh, I believe this kind of natural stimulus, not artificial one, but natural stimulus for collaboration definitely exists. But make it artificial, it's not a, it's not a right game. And I would like to react, Tim, if you don't mind, uh, for a uh, very direct question about social calamity, catastrophe. Uh, probably you will disagree with me, but I believe in some cases, uh, organizational bankruptcy of the institution, we should afford ourselves somehow. Because otherwise we need to artificially support all kinds of institutions which already exist. We, it's not, I agree with you, it's not, it's not the right, right policy. Uh, that's, it's, a, it's a new world. We are already competing. And if we will, if we will, if we will still, sorry, if we will continue still support very weak institution because the social atmosphere or something like this, uh, the students and brilliant people will travel in a different geography. <laughs> That's the result 
of artificial approach. That's why I believe national policy and government policy should afford, in spite of social problem, afford bankrupt bankruptcy of some institutions. Would someone like to respond and continue this? Uh, sorry, Tim, I want oh. to discuss just as the question. So, we'll uh, yeah, finish one more. Finish, finish yeah. yeah. Just as the question as the competition and the corruption. I want to take an example. I think this is both important uh, in the future and in the university. Uh, like the Shanto University, our university and the GTIT, the GTIT stepped with the Shanto University and the Technio. Uh, the uh, Technical Shanto University and the GTIT. Uh, if you uh, said competition, maybe it's right. But the cooperation is most important uh, for us. Uh, we can share the talent, share the resource. Uh, and uh, the difference level, uh, every student's difference level. Uh, we can do the, the Technical in the ISRO, the Technical focus on the fundamental research. And all university focus on the transformation uh, for the uh, community. Because ACRO's fundamental research is very strong. But the China, China's market is so large. So the ACRO universities start uh, the zero to one. And the Chinese university can do something from the one to make them. So the cooperation is very good. So I think the competition is limited, but the cooperation is very nice, very, very <coughs> important. So it's my speak. Um, do you have a Can question I? from Olga and then maybe mm -hmm. a question from uh, Professor Robertson over there, please? Can I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My name is Olga Sudibor. I am from Kazakhstan. I represent Turan University, which is a very special name actually for all Turkish nations. Uh, first of all, before asking a question, I would like to highlight some ideas which were very appealing from the speakers. I do share opinion of uh, Mr. Volkov who said that money doesn't mean everything when we speak about excellence and how to build excellence. I share their ideas of Mr. Lau who said, yes, when we think about excellence, we are torn between teaching and we are torn between research because who does the research? those who are taught well to do this research. Uh, and I do share a lot of ideas by Mr. Froemin. Um, however harsh it sounds when he said that, yes, competition is a tough thing. Those who cannot like, catch up, they need to leave this race. Um, thank you for these ideas. They give, gave me extra food for the th thought. Now my question is the following. The session sounds national education initiatives drivers of success. In innovation theory, we have two terms, catching up and leapfrogging. Do you think that national initiatives, let's speak about, for example, Bologna process, uh, Russian Federation is a part of this process, Kazakhstan is a part of this process. Is it a way of catching up or helping the universities to sometime to ever leapfrog? Or do you think it is the matter of um, critical mass of independent research, critical mass of achievements of separate universities who then push the country and we understand that we need excellence as the competitive factor for the country also. Why, why does the country support universities, yes? To turn education into the soft power and to fight for the national priorities. Uh, at least this is my vision, why the <coughs> government stimulates such initiatives. So do you think this is the government as the critical agent who helps us to leapfrog or catch up? Or the universities, separate universities, who unite maybe their efforts or one by one, who help the country to make advancements? Thank you. Uh, Dean. That's a... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to... Go left because I started left and I'll go back to you. Do you want to comment on that, Alan? Uh, that, I think there's a, yes, I think these are kind of the chicken and egg questions. <laughs> yes, uh, um, because I'm engineering, I'm from engineering, I'm engineers. And for our research or our teachings, we need facilities, we need equipment. 
always those kind of equipment facilities is very, very expensive. And in terms of the university funding alone, it will, it will not be able to, to purchase those kind of facilities. Then we need the government support to have facilities and to teach. But in some other discipline, that may be different. You don't need to have so much money to buy the facility. Then maybe the university to do something good and then to push back to the government, to support the government. So it's, it's very difficult to, 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 to answer whether it should be this way is better or that way is better. But it's kind of chicken and egg. But my personal feeling is that as academics, we have to know what we should do. We are not just waiting for the government to tell us what we should do, waiting for the money from the government. If we identify that is the right direction we should go, then we have to go, we have to do. I have, I have, I have seen that some of the academics, when the government say, okay, we want to push this direction, we have a several million to push to support this direction. And a lot of academics suddenly say they are in that particular field. But a day after the government changed the policy, they said this field is not important anymore. And suddenly, those academics suddenly say, oh, I'm, I'm not working in this field. I mean, this is kind of a quite, quite ridiculous thing happens. So my personal feeling is that not the university do something to support the government or the government to support the university. Is we should know what we should do and do it, doing the best. And with, with the government see it is a niche, then they will support. So this is my personal philosophy. <laughs> so I sell, in my university, we sell them to wait for the government to support us. We try to do something good and then talk to the government. This is an important area you should support. Thank you. So this is my answer. Mm -hmm. Andre, what's, what's uh, your response to that? Thank you. I believe it's an excellent question and it's very relevant for the political, the big political situation. Mm -hmm. My direct answer from government perspective is just for catch up. It's not for leapfrog. Let's imagine the picture that Kazan State University and the physical technical institution and some are already on the position number one, number two, number three in the world. Do you believe Russian government will initiate Executive initiative, forget about. We're already number one. So definitely the initiative is to be, to be in a big rank like other countries, like other best institutions. But I believe it's intellectual responsibility of institution, not the government, to overcome this barrier and to see extra future. So government is just platform, just infrastructure, just stimulus, but responsibility on the overcome something to be number one uh, should be on the shoulder of rector's team and, and just people who are behind of the story, not for the government, not for the state uh, employees. That's my response to your excellent question. Thank you. Does anyone else want to comment, or should we? Have you got a question from Professor Robertson over there? Oh. So, well, we, we'll take two questions because there's two people with their hands. If you'd like to ask your question first, and then we'll go straight to um, five rows behind, please. Yes, thank you so much. I am Adam Sohail, uh, and I am representing Government College University, Lahore, Pakistan. And it is, uh, as you know, that we have faced uh, some very hard times vis-a-vis -vis higher education and we, are, we have been in doldrums as well. So uh, coming to you about this uh, bureaucratic approach or intervention, we have been talking about it's the same there as well because on the one side they call us autonomous institutions and on the other hand it's the public uh, sector university and funding agency is the government. And then there are unnecessary interventions, bureaucratic interventions. Have you, I mean, we all, we all lament and talk about all these uh, bureaucratic uh, interventions. My little question or uh, loud thinking is, how to circumvent this unnecessary, unnecessary bureaucratic intervention in the higher education institutions. Uh, thank you. Psychologically, psychologically, we should accept it like a bad weather. And that's all. Uh, no other way around. And I believe, I don't know Pakistan situation. I was in Pakistan, but I don't know, I don't know Pakistan situation with bureaucracy. 
But I believe we are world champion, uh, like a bureaucratic country, I mean Russia, from a Soviet Union tradition. That's why it's difficult, it's, it's terrible, but to have, extra, to, to have opportunity to have extra money, we need to accept this part of the game. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a negative part of the story. But a positive part of the story in Russia is that uh, just six months ago, it was a high-level government discussion government discussion, how to reduce this bureaucracy pressure for institutions, especially in program 5100, which is uh, give us a little optimistic view for the future in Russia. Thank you. Can we... Susan Robertson, uh, Cambridge. Um, I just want to offer some reflections, I think, on the competition debate. Um, mostly the economists will tell us that competition was essentially to generate efficiencies in the system. But sometimes I do wonder whether our means and our ends have been confused. Um, and because essentially, if we think about how competition is really working, it's to generate reputational status. And the beneficiaries, it may well be you know, better grants and so on, but the beneficiaries will often be those students who then go to the top universities and take the positional good, high-ranking universities, and that becomes the means for social mobility. Um, and it's, and I'm reflecting on uh, one of the uh, constituencies of the vote to leave uh, Europe was actually quite a well-educated upper working class, lower middle class group who felt that they had actually worked hard, paid and invested in themselves, but had actually missed out. So I'm wondering whether when we think about national education initiatives and drivers of success, one of the measures isn't just global competition, but actually it's forms of social cohesion. Um, in other words, the OECD um, actually way before Piketty was putting on the table their major concerns about the lack of social cohesion. If Brexit isn't a statement about the lack of social cohesion uh, in the UK, then I'm not sure what it is. Post-war period, where essentially uh, I'm from Australia, universities were part of nation-building projects, and nation-building actually meant trying to invest also in social cohesion. So we could do a little thought experiment and say, what if we actually put some of our incentive money into the lower-performing institutions? So don't run with a trickle-down, but we actually look at a, an, another investment model. Just a thought. Thank you, Susan. And that, we've got about five minutes on the clock when that actually neatly leads to my final question, perhaps, which I'll pose to all of you. Building from that, Kazan Federal University, one of its most famous alumni is Tolstoy, the, you know, the, the writer. And national education initiatives, all the conversations that we've had here have been about funding and partnerships with engineering, about the impact of science, about building new innovation. Are, they, are we marginalizing the social sciences and humanities here? You know, we talk about it's too soon to tell the social impact of, of universities, but clearly, as, as our colleague from the, the Musical Institute in Moscow you know, mentioned, you know, they, they must be maintained because they have this cultural impact. As Professor Robertson says, social cohesion is a vital outcome of, of universities as well. So what, what do you feel about humanities? Is this being forgotten, or is it all about... Isn't it the, the, the world stage. What about close to home? May, may, may I start because you made um, Tim um, a small mistake. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and I, it, it's but but that's very interesting. Uh, in fact, there are two most famous uh, alumni of this university, and we are really privileged to be here. Uh, Lev Tolstoy and Vladimir Lenin, but the secret that both of them are not alumni. Uh, Lenin was expelled for uh, organizing a, a secret Marxist group and a political rebellion, and Lev Tolstoy, in fact, dropped out and he left very interesting note why he dropped. In, in fact, he praised the university because when he was the second year student, 
the professor of history gave him Montesquieu book, uh, how to, how it's in English? Okay, anyway, uh, the French uh, 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 Enlightenment uh, book uh, about human rights, etc., etc., and Tolstoy made it his mind, left universities to open, uh, to help uh, his peasants, etc., etc. So universities, uh, this university played a really critical role both in the Russian literature, in world literature, and in world, in world politics by giving the, his, these students this impetus. But it was not, probably in the case of Tolstoy is different, but in the case of Lenin, it was not the intention of university. So uh, my answer is that we shouldn't forget about humanities, but maybe we just have to give a space to young people. And frankly speaking, in fact, we did an analysis, we did a study of how students feel uh, this excellent initiative. And they are becoming more energetic. They are becoming more dynamic. The culture of university changes. They don't want to be in this routine that looked only back 100 years. So maybe uh, this excellence initiative with all these uh, side, uh, negative side effects also have profound impact on students, their energy and initiative. Thank you. Um, Aki, Chan Hong, do you want to respond in terms of the emphasis of social science in your institution? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, so the, I the, probably this is the last remark for me. So the, let me uh, uh, raise two kind of the pro question or the kind of provocative, provocative argument. One is about the uh, innovation. So the innovation, uh, of course, uh, it's a political term. Uh, I do understand the, the meaning of the catching up, but. Uh, if we focus more kind of technical meaning of the innovation in science and technology, it means that basically the knowledge creation that will directly lead to the implementation of the radical improve, improvement of productivity. And uh, this, there is no evidence, or there is no clear uh, discussion that the how we can foster the innovation. So the innovation cannot be uh, focused, uh, fo uh, the forecasted, means that we cannot invest uh, to some area and then the, we cannot make sure that the innovation can surely happen there. So this is uh, really the big challenge for us and uh, so the political discussion about uh, enhancing innovation is really still the very, very beginning stage and that we cannot say that this will really succeed or not. So my, my point is that, uh, that, that that is one of the things we have to apply for the social science of humanities as well. So that at this moment, uh, regardless it is a science or the humanities or social sciences, the, it is very, very dangerous uh, to make a kind of the intentional uh, the concentration of the resources. That is my one point. And the second point is that uh, maybe let me explain this anecdote. About 20 years ago, uh, actually we have a very strong uh, orientation, especially for national university, to elect, uh, pro uh, nominate the president from the social, uh, 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 the STEM field, science and technology field. Uh, 20 years ago, most of many popular uh, field was, most popular field was civil engineering. And I think quite natural that, you know, the civil engineering means that uh, you have to gather many people and uh, give the law to them and uh, make a kind of design for them. But uh, these days, those people are replaced by the people from the information technology, information science. So actually, we don't need uh, people, but uh, if we have an indicator, we can manage the university. That is a kind of a new idea we are seriously thinking about. So the, uh, my point is that apparently the, the humanities and social sciences are also changing quite a lot. Uh, so the, uh, and then the, so the, probably it is not an 
issue of the science, uh, the, the field, but the much more like uh, the way of the thinking, the way of the behavior is now fundamentally changing and the, the indicator or the ranking is one of the, this kind of phenomena. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aki. Um, Alan, do you want to make a final comment on how social science and humanities are supported in Swinburne? And no, that to me, uh, excuse me? Oh. No, no, it's just my. Uh, to me, the social science is very important. In Swinburne, we have an institute, particularly look after these directions. Because we're human, we are working, we are living, we are working in the society. Without social science, I don't think it's work in the country or in the, in the, in the city. So to, to, our, uh, to my university perspective, we support social science a lot. And we have a big team. Actually, we, as, as we, already, we established an institute level to work in this area. But of course, a lot of people will criticize if uh, in terms of the ranking, uh, engineering, science, biomedical, they always get, if your university has these disciplines, always get high ranking. But remember, as a university, we are not just look at ranking. We also have to know about what we should do. So social science is one of the key particular area, disciplines that we should invest. So we, in our university perspective, we actually invest a lot of money in this area. So there's a critical area, important area in the country. Thank you. Um, Andre, do you want to? Yeah, just a quick yeah. reaction. Uh, if you take the, if I take into consideration that uh, originally I am from nuclear physics uh, and have this, this kind of background, I totally support enhancement or <coughs> increasing capacity in humanities and social mm. studies research and training in Russian universities, and uh, I believe. Uh, in spite of all the, uh, all the attention to the STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, I believe the great institution cannot be university without humanities and social uh, studies, research, good training. It's, in my language, it's education, not just training. Thank you. Chan Hong, do you want to? Uh, sorry. I think the library knowledge is important for the students' innovation. Uh, if you want to uh, push the students, it takes a long way, you must uh, take some of the fundamental knowledge for, for students. I think so. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. We have a clock on stage here that tells us how much time we have uh, remaining in the schedule, and I'm afraid that it's, it's come down to zero. Um, so. In the interests of giving us all time to, to come back to the next sessions um, this evening and tomorrow, I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap it up. But I would encourage everybody to um, continue this, this conversation later. Um, and before leaving here, obviously, please join me in giving a great thanks and applause to all of our panelists. <laughs>